We're going to now take a look at another type of derivative called, called futures contracts. And the book puts this chapter before options, and I kind of understand why. But futures are simpler than options, even though they're a little tricky uh, to, to think about something that's going to happen in the future. Uh, but, but they are, I believe, far more important and, and have a real economic benefit to the society. So we waited until after we had gotten done options to deal with futures. And it, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemlitz, summed it up best on slide number one. There are two times in a man's life when he should not speculate. When he can't afford it, and when he can. <laughs> yeah. And, and Mr. Twain really understood this. It's unfortunate that Samuel Clements, who was the real guy, didn't. Because he speculated in highly dubious business ventures and lost a fortune. Right, exactly. So he learned this line from personal uh, uh, experience. Okay, but, but wait a minute. Piano, didn't you say these things really do make economic sense? Uh, the answer is yes, they do. But that doesn't mean they're not dangerous. They are, especially for speculators. Now, hang on a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with slide number two. What are futures? Futures contracts, right? Exactly. It's options, contracts, futures, contracts. And so what people often do is just forget the, the word contract. It's a commitment to deliver a certain amount of some specified item at some specified date in the future. Sometimes they're called forward contracts, yeah, but futures contracts is, is more, um, more popular. A buyer and a seller specify a commodity or financial instrument to be delivered and paid when the contract matures. The futures price is guaranteed by the contract. So, you, so, you, so it's like an options contract, futures contracts are contracts. And, and they derive their value from the underlying item, which used to be only commodities, but now it's many other things, as we'll see. Futures started with commodities, hard assets, sometimes they're called real assets, wheat, soybeans, cattle, pork bellies, gold, oil, etc 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 but they have since moved to financial assets huh yeah right they have moved to the finance world where you can buy futures on stocks and stock indices and currencies let's take a look at slide number three what is the purpose of futures why are these things around well, folks, it's more than just gambling, as it is with options, for the most part. Producers of commodities use futures contracts extensively. If you're a producer of a commodity, say a wheat farmer, and you have a thousand acres of wheat, which is a lot of acres, folks, you know, and, and I don't know how much a thousand acres a week produces, but let's say he, the, 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 the farmer in Iowa, plants his, his, uh, his wheat in April. He knows that if all goes well, Lord willing and the crick don't rise, come September he will have 500,000 bushels of wheat. Okay, but, but the, he just put the stuff in the ground. It's not there yet. It, you're not going to get it until August, eight, September. September wheat futures are currently, right now in April, selling for $6 per bushel. How does he know? He calls his broker. He goes online. He sees that there are people who will buy a contract so that they will accept 500000 He doesn't have to sell the whole amount. He might sell 200000 or 300000 He will be able to sell his contract, he sell his wheat in September for $6 per bushel. And he's happy with that amount. So he sells his wheat. He sells a futures contract. He sells his wheat while it is still in the ground to be delivered in September. 
he can guarantee a price that he is happy with and will result in a profit. The contract states that he will deliver the wheat in September and receive $6 per bushel no matter what happens to wheat prices. Now, if wheat prices skyrocket, oh well, he has to pay, he, I mean, sorry, he has to receive $6 for his wheat. If prices are, um, are, are plummet, now you understand. You see, the, 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 pro the uh, producer of the wheat, the farmer, is protecting himself against price declines. If the price declines, he can still sell his wheat for $6 per bushel. And folks, you have to know that farming is one of the hardest things in the world to do. Because if everything goes well, and the rain comes just at the right time, and the sun comes at the right time, and the bugs don't eat the, the, all the plants, and there's no mildew, and, and everything is happy, guess what? The price plummets. Huh? What? Yes, because everybody is drowning in wheat, or soybeans, or corn. And you understand it. And, and then if everything turns out bad, there's a flood and the mildew and the, and the sun doesn't shine and the bugs come, the price skyrockets. You don't have any wheat to sell. It's a very difficult business. Slide number four. Okay, who's on the other side of the contract? Well, who needs 500,000 bushels of wheat? You and I don't need that. But Kellogg's and General Mills and Post Cereals, they are the consumers of commodities. So they need tons and tons of wheat each year to make cereal and other foodstuffs. So via futures contracts in April, they can purchase the wheat to be delivered in September and pay $6 per bushel no matter what happens to wheat prices. So you see what's going on? They are guaranteeing a price that they will pay. Now, if prices plummet, hey, we're protected. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I meant that, that's the wrong thing. That's the farmer. If prices plummet, oh, well, we're stuck. We have to pay six bucks. But if prices skyrocket, ooh, we're protected. So they are the buyers of the futures contract. What are the disadvantages? What are the advantages when you're the producer, when you're the consumer? Well, we've already discussed them. You're protecting yourself against adverse price increases or decreases, depending on which side of the contract you're on. And of course, if they go your way, oh, well, you're stuck. But hey, at least you protected yourself. So you see what that's why futures are very popular, because producers and consumers use these things all the time and they may they allow for um, you to, to predict you know what's going to happen you you know ah yes I'm going to be able to make a profit or ah yes I'm going to be able to buy at a price that make means that we can sell our cereal for a good profit slide number five futures contracts allow producers and consumers of commodities to hedge there's that word again <laughs> have you heard the saying hedge your bet the farmer is protecting himself from wheat prices falling, and the cereal companies are protecting themselves from wheat prices rising. And here's the definition of hedging, and I want you to, to, to study this because you know it's, you, it's easier, I think, for many people to understand the concept, but they can't describe it very well. And this is a perfect description here. It's a good definition. Hedging in futures means taking a futures position opposite to an existing position in the underlying commodity or financial instrument. You see, you have wheat to sell, you hedge by taking a position opposite the sale. So you're saying, I will sell. I will sell at $6 per bushel in six months. And if you're the one who's buying, you take a position opposite that I will buy um, at $6 a, 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 a bushel. I hedge my bet. Now, of course, if prices go your way, yeah, oh well. And you don't have to hold on to the contract. You can actually sell the contract before the uh, the, the delivery date. You know, the, the futures contracts are securities. They are bought and sold every day. So if, if prices do go your way, well, great. You can sell the futures contract for a, a, a profit and still sell your, your, your um, wheat or vice versa. 
if you're the cereal companies. Slide number six. Here's a, a, a table from the book. This is not an all-inclusive table, but, but these are the kind of commodities that are bought and sold every day via futures. Corn, oats, soybeans, wheat, barley, canola, flaxseed, sorghum. They don't have that on the list. Sorghum is very important. And then livestock, cattle, uh, hogs, pork bellies. You, there was a movie called Trading Places where they talked a lot about pork bellies. What is what are pork? That's bacon. And then metals and petroleum and other chemicals, electricity, copper, gold, electricity futures. Yeah, yeah. And some of you might remember the... Uh, the uh, price spike of energy in 2000 when electricity went through the roof while well, they tried to deregulate the market so fast that these futures speculators just just had ran wild. And oil. We hear that the price of oil, crude oil, is $110 a barrel or $100 a barrel. I think it's around 100 right now. Well, that's not today, folks. That's three months from now. And there are other times, but they normally quote the price of a barrel of crude oil to be delivered in three months. So that's why when you hear the price skyrocketing or, or falling, it takes a while for the price of the pump to change because, first of all, the crude has to get there. It takes three months. And then they have to refine it. That takes a few weeks. And then they got to get it to the gas station. So, so that's why it ta there's a lag time involved. And then, you know, orange juice and cotton and coffee. So these are commodities that are bought and sold via futures all the time. And it allows the producers and the consumers to plan their economic uh, well-being, to plan their transactions. Slide number seven. What are financial futures? Well, folks, the financial world adopted the technique of futures contracts to financial assets, treating financial assets like commodities. Currencies, interest rates, stock and bond indices. I will deliver $25,000 worth of British pounds to you next April in one year or whatever. I will purchase $10,000 worth of the Standard & Poor's 500 stock index from you next August. Now, why would you want to do this? Again, to hedge your bets. If you know you're going to need British pounds next year or you know that that um, you have um, uh, a Standard & Poor's uh, portfolio of the like, you can, 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 can protect against the... Now, in this, in this respect, it's kind of like insurance, isn't it? Yeah. Slide number eight. For those working in the world of finance, and especially the world of international business, they can be very useful tools. For example, a car manufacturer knows... It will need to purchase 50,000 engines from Japan next October. So the manufacturer today can buy a currency future for $20 million worth of Japanese yen payable in October. Now, how did the car manufacturer protect themselves? What happens if the dollar falls relative to the yen? Well, na, 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 they don't have to worry about that because they know they're going to get $20 million worth of Japanese yen payable in today's currency um, uh, uh, transaction amount. So, so if the dollar falls relative to the yen, it doesn't bump up their cost to $25 million. Now, what if the dollar rises? Oh, well, they bought protection they didn't need. So you understand how these financial futures can work kind of like the, 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 the farmer and the, and the, and the cereal company? If you own a ton of stock, uh, uh, you can say, oh, I, I want to protect myself. So you would, uh, how would you do this? Now, let me think. I, I don't do this myself. So so if you were the per person who owned the stock, what kind of future would you buy? Let me see if I can get this right. I'm doing this live, of course. I could always pause the darn thing. But you would want a contract that would pay out if prices fell. So if prices fell, so you would sell the contract, right? You would sell the contract to say, I will uh, uh, produce, I will uh, deliver to you a certain amount of uh, stocks in six, nine months or whatever. So you see how these things can work? Same like oil and, and pork bellies and corn and wheat. Right, right, okay. Now, 
Slide number nine. Now, here's where it gets interesting. <laughs> or scary, if, if depending on who you are. Can anybody purchase futures? Can I get in on this action? Lucky you! You do not have to work in either the commodities world or the financial world to buy and sell financial futures contracts or commodities futures contracts. You can be a speculator. <coughs> Another word, trader, right? Futures trader. You simply buy and sell the futures contracts. You have no intention to ever deliver or take delivery of the commodity or nor the financial asset. You could buy, excuse me, <coughs> you could buy the 500,000 bushels of wheat to be delivered in September, although, even though you live in a condo in West L.A. and you've never even seen a farm. <coughs> what do you think of this strategy, right? What is your limit to your losses? And this is where you hear people screaming and hollering about the oils speculators who are bidding up the price of oil. Well, everybody complains when they bid up the price of oil. But when they lose their shirts because oil actually falls, if they, if they, if they bet that the price would keep going up and they kept bidding it up, 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 and up, and up, and the price actually falls, they lose their shirts, folks. They lose tremendous sums of money nobody complains about that everybody complained in 2008 when the price hit 147 in the summer but nobody complained when the price plummeted to 39 dollars and gas went down to what two bucks or 250 a gallon right nobody complains about the speculators then now, am, am I saying you should be a speculator? No. Am I defending the speculators? No. I think it's stupid. I want nothing to do with it. I hope you'll have nothing to do with it because it's gambling, pure and simple, and you can make a lot of money very quickly, and you can lose it all just as quickly. Slide number 10, speculating. See, here's a definition of speculating. Accepting the future's price risk without having the position opposite to the existing position in the underlying commodity or financial industry. Instrument. I'm sorry, not industry. Instrument. So in other words, if you were the buyer of that futures contract for 500,000 bushels of wheat and you had no intention of, of making you know, million boxes of cereal or whatever, you are speculating. It is the opposite of hedging. Now here's a phenomenal quote from the fourth edition. In the, in the fifth and sixth edition, they sort of made it harder to, 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 to encapsulate in a single line. But futures speculation is risky. But it is potentially rewarding if you can accurately forecast the direction of futures price commodity movements. Can anyone accurately forecast the future? I mean, you got to know if you're, if you're buying wheat or selling wheat, you got to know what's going to happen with the weather. If our LA speculator sitting in her condo had purchased a futures contract for 500,000 bushels a week to be delivered in September and wheat prices plummeted, she could potentially lose hundreds of thousands of dollars so you see what you're playing with folks even though these things make more sense from an economic societal point of view as opposed to options they are far more dangerous than options in options you basically lose what you paid usually if you're a buyer of the options and and if you're a seller sometimes you lose big not usually it, things don't happen that often that that dramatic sometimes they do but very rare but in the futures world entire fortunes can be made and lost in in a matter of days so there you have it slide number 11 where are these traded well this chicago board of trade is the big kahuna on the on the block but there are many many other places where these are traded on the major exchanges and smaller exchanges Long position, short position. Wait, long and short. What are you talking about? You keep saying selling short. What do you mean? Well, we'll go. We'll, that's next chapter. Okay, we're going to get into margining and selling short. So if you remember this, great. If you don't remember this, that's fine. The long position is the buyer of the futures contract. They are protected from futures price increases. So, so that's the uh, Kellogg's, the General Mills, the, the Post Cereal, and the short position is the seller, the farmer. He is protected against decreases, all right? And, and da, 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 we'll get back to short and long in detail in the next chapter. So, so, so don't worry too much about that. Just realize what they are doing. They are trying to protect themselves against adverse price increases or decreases because they got a plan for the future. It allows them to 
plan better for the future. Slide number 12. So let's take a look at some, uh, some uh, similarities. Futures seem like options. Well, they're both derivatives. They, the two are very similar. Futures, financial futures work very much like options. There's a potential for great rewards, but there also is much more the likelihood of sustaining great losses. In fact, the potential losses from future contracts are staggering and just like options, <laughs> they are a tremendous source of commissions for your broker. Oh, by the way, you can purchase options on futures contracts. <laughs> what do you think of that strategy? Oh, your brokers. I mean, they, 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 slide number 13. Final comments on futures. You already know what I'm going to say. Stay away from them. <laughs> they are even more potentially dangerous than options. You know what? I need a picture of the radioactive symbol. That's what I need. I don't use too many pictures. And some people get angry at me for that. Yeah, they are great financial instruments for people who produce commodities and, you know, financial um, assets and consume commodities. But for you and I, for you and me, retail investors, unless you've got a real stomach for for gut-wrenching losses, I would recommend staying away from them. Slide number 14 to review. <laughs> um, what's next, right? What's next? Well, we're at the end of the semester, and we're about ready to take a look at brokerage accounts. Chapter 2. Huh? Chapter 2? Right. The book gets you started on buying and selling and teaches you about margining and selling short. And in Chapter 2, I think that's putting the cart before the horse, my my personal opinion. And so our next uh, chapter will be about brokerage accounts, buying and selling, buying on margins, selling short. Okay, see you in chapter two. I can go back and make sure you understand this stuff so that you can explain it to somebody else at least to their satisfaction. And that way, I'll look good. <laughs> They'll say, where did you learn that? And you'll say, well, Mr. Biano, Business 123. Here it is. Here's the website. Okay, sorry. Um, see ya.